Excellences, uh, it's the matter of my apologies to all of you for the certain delay because some very important intergovernmental and international meetings are still going on with the participation of the First Lady and the, His Excellency the President. That's why I uh, apply to your understanding and we will start within five, six minutes. So if you don't mind. In generally, the idea to have such kind of meeting came after long discussions with a lot of important people, scientists, international organizations, leaders, and we consider it is really the matter of all our common interest towards the understanding towards bringing joint activities in favor of the intercultural dialogue and implementation of the programs which requires the you know, correlation and cooperation in these matters. And this uh, initiative was supported, first of all, by United Nations Alliance of Civilization, UNESCO, United Nations World Tourism Organization, uh, I, ICESCO, uh, Council of Europe expressed interest in that, and we applied to several financial institutions, political institutions, and we were very pleased to feel that the leadership of these international organizations are looking forward to such kind of joint activity which will bring us for more efficient implementations of the intercultural dialogue like a vehicle to achieve peace, understanding, and through that to the sustainable development. And from this point of view, we count on your positive response and we see uh, all of you here in one big hall within the frame of the Forum for Intercultural Dialogue and our hope to have this uh, document and achievements, uh, documents and uh, discussions which we will have here to be uh, part, consistent part of the discussion of the forum. This kind of initiative uh, may be not something new in the world, but within the Forum for Intercultural Dialogue, we consider it's uh, important to have such kind of, not only discussion, but uh, cooperation and implementation of these facilities. We uh, have very important speakers today, we have very important guests today, and once more I would like to, th on behalf of the organizers, to thank all of you for such kind of contribution, uh, starting with your presence at the forum, uh, with your presence at this uh, international high-level organizations, high-level meeting, and of course, uh, in general participation of the forum itself. So, uh, Madame Bokova, please, you can come and proceed to your place, and now our First Lady will also join us, and we uh, will start. But uh, I hope you are not uh, very tired now. Uh, the opening, uh, the meetings are going on. Now, several panels are working very seriously. I would like to inform you that thanks to uh, support of United Nations, uh, we have uh, transmission of all events of this forum to the United Nations uh, site and to TV of United Nations. And uh, I think that it, it will bring uh, another importance to the matter. So maybe we will proceed or what is your, maybe we will start and then the first lady will come and make her intervention, if you don't mind. Sorry? Should we wait? So if you don't mind. So please, let's wait another five minutes and then. I can talk the, during these five minutes, but it will, it, it, it will not have any results, so you know. <laughs> it will not make the process quicker. <laughs> Uh, 
Maybe if you can tell us a little bit about who is here or something, you know, just around. That would be a summary of what, who's, what's going on in this. We have, uh, you will have the list of all participants, uh, all delegations, and we are proud to have 46 international organizations which joined to the uh, forum itself, starting with the regional organizations until the international uh, at the UN level organizations. We have also a uh, very big uh, number of countries which are presented at this forum and the different uh, organizations, I mean panels, discussions. And we have uh, today uh, inscribed the list of the participants who would like to make the f some intervention and comments on this matter. Uh, among them, uh, the leaders of the international organizations presented here and their opening ceremonies. We have uh, UNRC, we have UNESCO, we have OIC, we have ISESCO, we have Council of Europe, we have NATO, we have FAO, we have Turkish Consul, we have United Nations Office in Nairobi, we have United Nations Office in Azerbaijan, European Union, uh, CIS countries, uh, Organization, League of Arab States, Kaisid Dialect Center, and ECOS, United Nations ECOSOS, uh, those who are supposed to have some intervention, a proposal during the first part of the day. Uh, and then we have the World Bank Group, OECD, Organization for Economical Cooperation and Development, uh, Black Sea Economical Cooperation Organization, the Islamic Development Bank Group, UNICEF, United Nations Environmental Program, Arab Maghrib Union, United States Agency for International Development, USAID, Embassy of Swiss Confederation in Azerbaijan, French Development Agency, uh, Republic of Turkey Prime Minister, Turkish Cooperation and Coordination. So. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. First of all, I would like to welcome you to the first high-level meeting of the International Organization in the framework of FOSS World Forum in Intercultural Dialogue. I would also like to express my deep gratitude to our partners of the forum for their active support in holding this important event for the first time. Before moving on the topics of the session of this event, I would like to say a few words about our country. Azerbaijan is one of the few countries in which the world's geographical and cultural differences meet. Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, is a harmonious combination of East and West and of con contemporary and historical eras. Throughout its history, Azerbaijan has sheltered various communities and nationalities of diverse backgrounds and religions, living in condition of mutual cooperation and friendship. Known as the gate to the Orient and located at the crossroads of different cultures and civilizations, East and West, North and South, and being a member of both Islamic and European organization, Azerbaijan unites the values of multiple civilizations. Besides the significant role played by the various people populating Azerbaijan in the country's public and political life, you can see clearly how they are fully able to preserve their ethnic values, religions, and traditions. The atmosphere of national and cultural diversity coupled with the ethnic and religious tolerance in Azerbaijan has turned this country into a land of many nations and faiths, as well as a platform for cross-cultural di dialogue at a global level. Azerbaijan has a long history of fruitful and e efficient cooperation with various international organizations. And we are proud to host this first meeting that underlines the growing role of Azerbaijan in the field of promoting intercultural dialogue on an international scale. 
The first high-level meeting of the international organization is organized in partnership with the government of Azerbaijan, the Council of Europe, UNESCO, the United Nations Alliance of Civilization, ISESCO, the United Nations World, World Tourism Organization, and the FAO. Being an active member of this organization, Azerbaijan ha has organized numerous important international events. Azerbaijan is also one of the few countries which are member of both the Council of Europe and the Islamic Cooperation Organization. We are proud the active cooperation between these two leading international organizations started in Baku in 2008. Today, the Baku process is very important and unique international initiative. It is symbolic that, that by the end of May, Baku will have been home to the first ever European Games, which it hosted in 2015, and the fourth Islamic Solidarity Games, which are due to start next week. Across the two events, Baku will have hosted participants from over 100 countries. We consider this to be a part of the Baku process. Apart from important political initiatives which bring nations and religions closer together, Azerbaijan has implemented various humanitarian and charity projects in different parts of the world. Allow me to mention some of them. <coughs> construction, construction of a new school for girls in the Muzaffarabad region in Pakistan, which had been destroyed in an earthquake in 2005. Restoration of ancient Roman catacombs of Marceline and Peter. Restoration of historical monuments at the park of Chateau de Versailles in France. Construction of schools, mosques and churches, rehabilitation centers, medical clinics and recreation parks in several cities of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia, Hungary, Romania, Russia and Serbia. Restoration of around 20 Kuril churches in the region of Low Normandy and restoration of stained glass windows at the Strasbourg Cathedral in France. Restoration and digitalization of ancient manuscripts in the Vatican Apostolic Library and of several monuments at the Vatican Museum. Participation in the creation of the Department of Islamic Art at the Louvre Museum. Restoration of the Trapezitsa Architectural Museum, a reserve in Velika Tirnova, Bulgaria. Participation in the restoration of Berlin Castle in Germany. Restoration of the Hall of Philosophers in the Capitolium Museum in Rome, Italy. These examples give you a clear idea about our strong belief in the merits and potential of intercultural dialogue. Our contribution to the preservation of global cultural heritage demonstrates Azerbaijan's long-standing commitment to the values of multiculturalism. Dear friends, today world seriously needs to preserve and promote the values of civilization that enjoy mutual understanding and enrich and support each other. In the framework of this process, a great responsibility lies with governments, politicians, international organizations, and the media. This process still faces significant challenges today. Millions of people around the world still continue to suffer from poverty, hunger, social inequality, health threats, and other face natural or man-made disasters, violent extremism, terrorism, and related humanitarian crises. crises. We can particularly say that in some cases the international law is not respect or its norms are violated by double standards. Actually, issues related to human lives and the right of everyone to save life should be upheld as the most cherished principles. In this regard, intercultural and interreligious dialogue and cooperation coupled with principles of understanding and respect, stand in the core of development of societies. In order to realize our goals, mankind needs to overcome the barriers of extremism and xenophobia by interacting with, with each other and building stronger ties across nations. We highly appreciate the assistance carried out by the international organization and financial and economic 
institution and recognize that as an integral part of this process. The goal is realizing this high-level meeting is to bring together the world's political, cultural, economic, social, financial, and other international organizations to debate human security, sustainable development, and issues related to inclusive society. We also aim to encourage joint action to settle tension between cultures and civilization, oftentimes stemming from religious, cultural, and social constraints. This initiative will establish an additional platform to mobilize resources and conduct shared activities in order to make the world a safer place. Participants of the first high-level meeting of international organizations have committed themselves to fostering intercultural understanding, tolerance, mutual respect, and the ethic of global citizenship and shared responsibility. We all recognize the cultural diversity of the world and agree that all cultures and civilizations can and should contribute to sustainable development. These are not easy issues to resolve. We may all have different cultural backgrounds and our own views on various subjects, but I believe we should all at least recognize the existence of different perspectives and remain open to them. Even if engaging in dialogue does not guarantee immediate agreement, simple understanding of others serves as a reasonable beginning in an attempt to bridge the gap between ideas and perceptions. It is certainly better than conflict. In conclusion, I would like to wish you interesting and fruitful discussion that should strengthen our conviction to continue the dialogue and enable us to successfully overcome numerous ch challenges that we're all facing today. Once again, welcome to Azerbaijan and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, First Vice President of Republic of Azerbaijan. Uh, thank you for intervention and now we proceed to the discussion and the first floor is given to the Ambassador, UN High Representative for the Alliance of Civilization, Mr. Nasser Abdulaziz El Nasser. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, Your Excellency, Mrs. Mehrban Aliyev, First Vice President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Your Excellency, Mr. Abulfaz Karev, Minister of Culture and Tourism of Azerbaijan. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me commend the leadership of Azerbaijan and your excellency and the government of Azerbaijan for what you are doing and promoting dialogue among culture and religions around the world. I would like to recall the relevance of chapter eight of the UN Charter on the cooperation between regional arrangements with the UN in maintaining international peace and security. To that end, the international community and the UN would not be able to advance their agenda without the crucial cooperation of sub-regional arrangements and regional actors. During the past four years, the UN Alliance of Civilizations has expanded its outreach and engagement with other UN agencies and organizations. We contributed to the UN Secretary General Together initiative through our collaboration with DBI. We are also members of the CTITF working group on communications that aim at coordinating and all of the UN strategy of, for communication on programs to counter terrorism and preventing violent extremism. Moreover, we sought to strengthen our collaboration with existing international and regional organizations, such as the League of Arab States, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, the European Union, the Black Sea Economic Cooperation, the Turkic Council, Onward Foundation, and CAICID. We have been working towards promoting inclusive dialogue and achieving sustainable development 
and partnership with several governments, regional and international organizations. I would like to seize the opportunity to express our greatest appreciation for the accomplishment achieved together. We are proud of this partnership and we look forward to achieving much more progress. Human security, social inclusion, and sustainable developments are the prerequisites for achieving peace. These components are intertwined and reflected in all our projects and activities to promote intercultural dialogue and build peaceful societies. A human security places people at the center of strategic and action, emphasizing the importance of dignity, human rights, and development. This is what we do at the UNAOC. Through our four pillars, namely migration, media, education, and youth, we ensure that young people and civil society leaders are, uh, are at the core of our work. While developing our programs and activities, we make sure that no one is left behind that everyone gets access to education and learning programs, employment, and equal opportunities. We work towards restoring dialogue, proving that virtues of respect and understanding, the richness of diversity, we give back their dignity and their future to those who have been deprived of their rights. Let me give you a few illustrations through our hashtag Spread No Hate initiatives, launched in December 2015. We have reached out to millions of people worldwide on the issue of hate speech against migrants and refugees fleeing war and conflict. Thanks to four symposia organized in collaboration with the, with the European Union, IOM, journalists, media organization and other key partners from civil society and the private sector. We have succeeded in mobilizing people for a shift in the treatment of migrants and refugees in the media and on internet, thus contributing to protect their dignity and fostering their integration in host communities. Hashtag spread no hate has been contributing to build peaceful and inclusive societies by combating discrimination and racism. Interfaith and intercultural dialogue is key in all the activities that the Alliance is leading. Another concrete example of how UNAOC contributes to building social inclusion and promoting peace in the Young Peace Builders Project. We launched the first iteration of this promising project in West Africa in December 2016. Thanks to these activities, 20, 20 young coming from 12 countries in the region were trained on how to address stereotypes and polarization. Human security cannot be achieved without sustainable development, which depends widely on the role of civil society actors and grassroots organization. Therefore, the Alliance has been supporting young civil society leaders and grassroots organizations through the Youth Solidarity Fund. In the past 18 months, UNAOC provided grants and technical support to 11 youth-led organizations working on preventing conflict and promoting peace and social inclusion. By doing so, the Alliance contributes to achieving peace and human security, but also to implementing the SDGs. Progress and innovation must be part of our priorities. They can only be revealed through partnerships. This is why UNAOC has been carrying out for five, for fifth year the Intercultural Innovation Award, IAA, and partnership with the BMW Group, which has been a real mentor for so many civil society leaders. It is crucial 
to address the problem of youth unemployment, not only to ensure their development, but also to prevent instability, social conflicts, and reduce violent extremism. Most of today's conflicts are fueled by the lack of access to resources and opportunities in quality, secretar secretar divides, poor government, governance, my marginalization and inclusion. They are becoming worse by population growth and the globalization of violence and terrorism. The spread of violence extrem ex extremism around the world shows how complex and challenging this is. Yet, we spend far more time and resources responding to crises rather than preventing them while the causes of crisis are deeply interlinked. Our response remains fragmented. Military actions and security measures cannot be the only response to the challenges. The interconnected nature of today's crisis requires us to connect our own efforts for peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights, not just in words but in practice. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the General Assembly and Security Council Resolution on Sustaining Peace demonstrate strong intergovernmental support for an integrated approach. The challenge now is to make corresponding changes to our culture, strategy, structures, and operations. We need a whole new approach to put an end to these global scourges. We must commit to achieve human security and sustainable development. In partnership with regional organizations, mobilizing the entire range of those with influence, from religious authorities to civil society and the business community. And let us not forget to bring youth and women to the table. There cannot be inclusive and resilient societies without the participation of women. When gender equality embed the social fabric, society have a much better chance of achieving stability and preserving human dignity and prosperity. For the future, we need to do, more, to, to do far more to prevent war and sustain peace. The UN reforms that our new Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, is sitting in motion aimed to achieve this. Together, we need to demonstrate leadership and strengthen the credibility and authority of our organization by putting peace first. If we live up to our responsibilities, we will save lives, reduce suffering, and give hope to millions. As Mr. Guterres said in his first message as Secretary General, let us make this year, 2017, a year for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Nasser, and I have my honor and privilege to give the floor to the Director General of UNESCO, Madame Irina Bokova, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garaev, uh, Mrs. Aliyeva, First Vice President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, ministers, uh, colleagues and partners uh, from the United Nations system and other international organizations. Once again, let me say how honored I am to be here in Baku and also to address this meeting of uh, heads and representatives of the international organizations within the framework of the fourth World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. And of course, it's an opportunity once again to thank the government of Azerbaijan, especially His Excellency uh, President Ilham Aliyev for this initiative. We have been mentioning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this morning many times the Baku process. The Baku process, who was launched 10 years ago by President Aliyev, and I do believe that uh, this showed a great uh, prescience at the time. I think the increased relevance of the Baku process on the global stage is obvious, it's visible 
now when we place intercultural dialogue at the top of the international agenda. Because this has never been so urgent. The world, which is globalizing quickly, and societies that are connected, but it does not mean necessarily that there is more cooperation, that there is more respect and more mutual understanding. We see new forces of division, emerging, spreading hatred, intolerance, ignorance. We see conflict which tears societies apart and with the rise of violent extremism and terrorism, which is attacking societies practically everywhere. The world is facing the largest refugee displacement crisis of recent history. At a time when cultural diversity is under threat from the pressures of exclusive populism and sometimes xenophobia. So in this setting, we need indeed a new commitment to dialogue from everywhere, from every single level. I believe this is essential in order to empower men and women to understand and overcome these pressing challenges together. But it is also important in order to bolster inclusion and cohesion in societies, which are in any case undergoing deep, sometimes I would call them bewildering transformation. And this is important also to catalyze the innovation every country needs today for the century ahead. Challenges today are multiple, complex, and pay no respect to borders. There is no room for unilateralism or exclusion. Change is racing across the world. This cannot be undone. And our goal must be to embrace change on the basis of human rights and dignity, to shape it in positive direction, to craft a future that is more just inclusive and sustainable for every woman and man, as is within the Agenda 2030. And to do this, dialogue is a key. Dialogue in order to show diversity as a reality that has always been a source of strength and a dialogue to craft new policies that make the most of this reality for the benefit of all. In line with the theme of this session, I see intercultural dialogue as a way to connect the dots between efforts to advance sustainable development and to strengthen the foundations for peace. And if I may open a small bracket talking about Agenda 2030, let me say that we were among those partners, participants in the shaping of this new agenda with many of the partners around this table, definitely with the Alliance of Civilization, with ISESCO, uh, with uh, many, many others, including the uh, uh, the World uh, uh, Tourist Organization, we had numbers of meetings and discussions and conferences, consultations, in order to put to the table the question about the importance of intercultural dialogue, the importance of, uh, of tolerance, of accepting the other, the importance of culture, of heritage, of identities, in order to achieve the Agenda 2030, because we thought that without this so vital process and understanding of humanity, at the end of the day, we are talking about human beings, of humanity. Nothing can, uh, can be achieved in a sustainable manner and in an inclusive and equitable also basis. So I believe the idea, which of course stands at the heart of why UNESCO, the United Nations Organization for Education, Culture, Sciences and Communication exists in the first place, it is about building peace in the minds of women and men. This underpins also the strategic partnerships that we have forged with many, many of you. And also, this is at the basis of our leadership of the international decade for the rapprochement of cultures 2013-2022, which inspired all our action to build new bridges of dialogue between and within cultures. And because I know that Mrs. Zalieva always has insisted and has invited us to be focused, to be concrete during the last uh, uh, forum in, on intercultural dialogue that we had here, I'm very proud today to launch with you within this context the new result of a two years collaboration with UNESCO chairs on intercultural dialogue, which is entitled Interculturalism at the Crossroads, Comparative Perspectives on Concepts, Policies and Practices. And I would like to 
draw your attention to this publication, which is a tangible, I would say, outcome of the first academic forum of UNESCO chairs, which was, which was hosted here again in Baku within the framework of the last intercultural forum two years ago. This precisely connects the dots between theory, policy, and practice, and uh, how we move our efforts toward action. And I would like particularly to thank Professor Fethi Mansouri, the editor of this publication. I'm sure that he is with us here. Yes, please, Professor. I would like to thank you for this. Uh, um, he is the coordinator of, of our network, Unitwin Network, along with very many of the contributing chairs and experts, uh, some of whom maybe also are uh, here within this forum. So, when I mention that uh, it is important to look at the sustainable development agenda, of course, when we speak about intercultural dialogue and competencies, we believe this must start on the benches of schools. This must begin with skills and competencies, uh, what, what we call a new forms of cultural literacy, which is founded on the knowledge of one's own culture and that of others as a foundation for respect and for mutual understanding. And this is where uh, I believe uh, we consider education as the most effective way to disarm processes that can lead to extremism, to xenophobia, to uh, undermine, that may undermine prejudice. And this is the way to fight intolerance. And also what I believe is very dangerous, indifference. Indifference to xenophobia, indifference to intolerance. So that is why we have put within the goal number four of sustainable uh, development agenda, a very special target, which a program on global citizenship education to equip learners and skills and behaviors to make the most of the growing diversity in the world on the basis of solidarity. And talking about violent extremism, I think it is important once again to look at how through education we can prevent violent extremism, how we can support teachers in promoting peace in the classrooms, how we could boast the media literacy with young people to prevent radicalization over the internet. And we have contributing to many of our member states' partners in order to adopt preventive strategies in Morocco, in Mauritania, in Senegal, and elsewhere to build the capacity for policymakers and to develop guidance tools for teachers. As we at UNESCO are very also multi um, linguistic, allow me to continue in French. Uh, L'histoire récente, mesdames et messieurs, montre assez combien la puissance militaire, tout ce qui nous appelons hard power, ne suffit pas à construire la paix durable. Il faut aussi mobiliser le pouvoir de l'éducation, de la culture, de la liberté d'expression. Permettez-moi d'utiliser cette idée avec le cas du Mali. Et je sais qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons une forte délégation de Mali avec le président Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, avec la première dame qui est avec nous, avec la ministre de l'Agriculture et bien d'autres aussi experts. Mais euh, euh, je crois que c'est extrêmement important de rappeler tout ce qui s'est passé au Mali. Pour asseoir leur euh, main mise sur la ville de Tombouctou, les extrémistes, euh, violents ont tout de suite cherché à effacer le patrimoine, les traditions culturelles, les, les repères collectifs. Ils ont cherché à museler la presse, à fermer les écoles ou à endectroner les professeurs. Et c'est pourquoi, dès la libération de la ville, l'UNESCO s'est employé avec les maçons de la ville à reconstruire les mausolées détruits, à faire renaître la culture et la connaissance. Nous avons soutenu la formation des soldats du maintien de la paix pour protéger le patrimoine malien. Nous avons travaillé avec la Cour pénale internationale pour lutter contre l'impunité des crimes de guerre, de destruction délibérée du patrimoine culturel. Une étape historique a été franchie en 2016 lorsque la Cour pénale internationale a condamné Ahmad al-Fakih al-Mahdi à neuf ans de prison, un de ses extrémistes qui avaient détruit les mausolées. Et parallèlement, l'UNESCO a soutenu la production de plus de 20 000 manuel scolaire au Mali afin de promouvoir le patrimoine culturel africain comme source d'identité, de dialogue et de la paix. C'est dans cet esprit que nous avons soutenu la résolution historique 2347 du Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies sur la protection du patrimoine culturel. 
s'appuyant sur les instruments normatifs existants de l'UNESCO, le Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies a reconnu l'importance de la sauvegarde du patrimoine pour la paix et la sécurité dans le monde aujourd'hui. Et à travers les projets comme la route de l'esclave, la route de la soie et l'histoire générale de l'Afrique, ou encore la collection sur les différents aspects de la culture islamique, nous travaillons sans relâche pour montrer comment les cultures n'ont cessé de s'enrichir les unes et les autres, s'influencent et dialoguer. Les extrémistes violents cherchent à manipuler les religions, à déformer leur histoire et leur signification. Et nous devons répondre avec des exemples concrets et simples qui montrent au contraire leur richesse et leur diversité. Lorsque nous attendons dire que l'islam, c'est une religion violente, nous devons aussi aider à montrer toutes les, toutes les beautés de cette foi, les nombreuses réalisations du monde musulman, l'importante contribution de la culture islamique au progrès de l'humanité. C'est bien autre chose qu'un ajout religion ou culture. C'est une question de civilisation, de paix dans le monde et de paix civile. C'est le message de, qui est au cœur de tous les travaux de l'UNESCO et le même message qui soutient notre coopération avec l'Azerbaïdjan à travers la nouvelle plateforme Internet sur le dialogue culturel et cette nouvelle publication que nous venons de lancer. Alors, je tiens à remercier Azerbaïdjan encore une fois pour le leadership de nos partenaires et de confirmer notre compromis avec euh, cette responsabilité du dialogue interculturel et la paix aujourd'hui. Merci, monsieur le... Merci, madame le... Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Zelina Bokova. And now my pleasure and honor to give the floor to the Secretary General of the World Tourism Organizations of United Nations, Mr. Talib Rifaya, please. First Vice President, Madam Alayeva, it's a pleasure to be with you. This is the first time we have an opportunity to interact with you, and I assure you that it will not be the last. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. My dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, World Tourism Organization. Are we serious? Tourism? In the minds of many people, tourism is just a party. It's not anything serious. I want to tell you two stories before I connect what I want to say with the subject matter of this meeting. My first meeting with the UN family, Rina Bokova to my left was there, she would testify to this, eight years ago. I was introduced by the then Secretary General, Kofi Annan, as the new Secretary General of World Tourism Organization. I could swear I could see half a smile on the faces of the people, my colleagues in that room, as if they were telling the Secretary General, are you serious, tourism? We're here about serious strong matters. We're here about industry. We're here about agriculture, FAO about health, WTO, WHO, about labor, so on and so forth. Little did we all know about that. It is important to link the activities of UNWTO to the dialogue of civilizations, to the intercultural dialogue. Because when we talk about dialogue, we cannot only talk about educating people and us sitting around the table like this and discussing things in a fashion we think that the world around us is going to change simply because we reach certain conclusions. Yes, we can form partnerships around this table and these partnerships can develop projects and these projects and plans can make a difference on the ground. But I want to make a very daring and bold proposition. The best ever dialogue in the world is people meeting people, people seeing people as they are on their reality. We can never ever hold feelings of animosity or hatred to people that we had dinner with. We listen to their stories, listen to their music, see them as human beings. This is the most powerful dialogue that anybody can ever think about. That's precisely why we're here, that precisely when President Alayev 
and my very, very good friend, Abu Faz Garayev, insisted that I come. We came here in full force because we know that we're here for a bigger cause. My dear friends, the world today may be suffering from so many sicknesses and illness and shortcomings. But let me again reiterate what I tried to communicate this morning. The world is still in a much, much better shape than we all think about. If we allow the news of every morning's television or radio bulletin to put us down, we are missing the point that we have done so much progress in the last few decades. Today, the world sees us as one. It is the forces of globalization that are bringing us together. What we are seeing now in terms of symptoms of world leaders and tendencies that we tend to call popularism is simply a rejection of globalization. We think that we could run the world by running our countries well. No leader of any country anymore can avoid becoming a global leader. Any national leader that thinks or assumes that he or she can run his country well by focusing on his own country and claiming that it's his country first doesn't know that it is driving his own country into very unknown venues by doing that. The forces of globalization of this world are demanding every leader in this world to become a global leader. This is the real conflict that we have in the world of today. Today, we need to pass the message as people of the world, as voters, that we cannot accept anymore any leader that only runs on a national agenda. We cannot solve the problem of climate change by focusing on the national agenda. We cannot solve the problem of world trade and integration by focusing on the national agenda. We have to be world leaders in our own local communities. This is the real issue that the world is confronting today. The UN system, my dear friends, altogether, is a very indispensable part of this juggle because this organization that came out of the womb of the Second World War have reached a point where it has to make a decision for its own sake. The UN system may not be a perfect system, and it isn't. We know that. We, the people that work from inside the world, UN system know that very well. But it's an indispensable system. If there was no UN, we would have invented one. We need it to represent our global scene, per se. The problem, our frustrations with the UN system is not related to the performance of the UN system. It's related to our expectations. We're assuming that the UN can solve all our problems, our global problems. We're assuming that the UN must resolve all world conflicts in Yemen, in Libya, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in Ukraine, all over the world. We also assume that the UN system must solve our global warming problem. It's not going to happen overnight, and it will not happen only because we think that the UN system can do it. We definitely need to strengthen this system, work with it, because it's an indispensable system. This system, called the UN system, is the only true representation of our world today as a global world. Forces of globalization today are the only fact that we cannot deny. Globalization is not an option, my friends. It's not an option. It's a destiny and we need to work with. We need to bring the best out of globalization. We need to make sure that globalization does not leave anybody behind. We need to make sure that globalization is fair, equitable, and just. But to fight globalization and to look inwards and to build walls will never work. Because whoever would be advocating such an agenda would be on the wrong side of history. And nobody that's on the wrong side of history can ever prevail or be sustainable. So, in conclusion, we should never, ever 
give up on the correct path of history. We should never ever assume that the world is falling apart because it isn't. And this morning I tried as much as I can to illustrate the issue that it's communication and knowledge and information that makes us feel this way. Today, if something happens, I would immediately, we will all immediately get notification from this very small gadget over here. We cannot avoid information. There are less victims of terrorism today than there has ever been in history. There is less violence in the world today than there has ever been in history. But we feel otherwise because we are bombarded with information every time. So we must never so fail to see the big picture of things. Why am I so focused, enthusiastic, and committed and passionate about travel and tourism? Because travel and tourism, and travel in particular, is probably one of the most concrete, real manifestation and translation of the dialogue that we're all seeking. The dialogue should be between people and people, not between intellectuals and intellectuals. The dialogue should be between vendors in the street and visitors that come, and the way they bargain with each other to sell something or buy something. Dialogue should be between you and a young man and woman that's standing behind the desk at a hotel as a reception. Dialogue should be between us and taxi drivers that takes us from airports to hotels. This is the real dialogue and that's the real change. The world will become better if more people travel. The problem that we're having are having with people that don't travel and you know probably, you're intelligent enough to know what I mean. When people don't travel, they don't see the world around them. That's why travel is a very, very important activity. And that's precisely why the UN was so intelligent to include something like the UNWTO, the World Tourism Organization, within its ranks. Otherwise, why would they include a party within the ranks of the UN? We are an organization that celebrates everything that's beautiful in life. We try to highlight all the values that bring people together and we believe that working together with all of you around this table, and I'm delighted that we have managed to establish excellent relationship with many people around this table. Let me conclude by highlighting one very important thing related to the SDGs that we referred to in many of our speeches. The Sustainable Development Goals are without doubt our agenda for 2030. It's the only agenda that we should all support and rally and strengthen. As Irina Bokova said, this is an agenda that we worked to develop for many, many years and for a result of very hard work. We cannot drive parallel agendas. In this agenda, each and every sector, each and every region that is represented around this table can find something that they can work at. But most importantly, this is also a reflection of why this year and I'm going to ask each and every one of you to visit this small little tag that we have distributed. This is the slogan, this is the brand of the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. It is a year that we have dedicated in 2017 to highlight the role of travel in bringing people together and changing this world around us. To my right is a very fine lady, Her Excellency Sheikh Hamai bint Muhammad Al Khalifa, who's been designated as an ambassador for the international year. We've designated so far five or six very important dignitaries. The President of the Republic of Colombia, a Nobel Prize winner, is an ambassador. The President of Liberia is an ambassador. The President of Costa Rica is an ambassador. The former King of Bulgaria is an ambassador. And the list goes on and on. These are people that are going to help us highlight the role of travel and how can travel contribute to this dialogue that we're all so fixed about. It's not only about Islam. I'm a Muslim myself. Of course, we are at the forefront. We're targeted. But it's about how people see people. Today it's Islam. Tomorrow is Judaism. Yesterday was Judaism. The day after it will be something else. We need to get to a point where people see each other as people. 
This is what I wanted to share with you today. I know that my talk is not a conventional one. It is not even a written text, but it's a thought that I wanted to talk about this morning, but out of respect for the time that was given, we were not able to communicate this to you all. It's absolutely important that we do not lose sight of the important things in life and that we focus on making sure that it's our forces that will prevail because that's what will happen and it's up to us to choose on which side of the divide we all are. It's all about leadership and that's why we come to this country. It's about vision, it's about opening up. If every leader of this world starts to see that they have a responsibility and they must dedicate a portion of their time to work outside of their country because that's part of working for their country and for their people, we will be living in a better world. I may have to apologize. Uh, I think Abul Fass and I will have to go to another meeting. Sorry? We will have the break at 5 o'clock and then... Great. That's... That's the generosity of the Azerbaijani people. I thank you all very much, and I thank you all for being patient and listening to what I had to say. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Talib uh, As you noted, there are a lot of other sessions and discussions in the other panels. That's why our proposal is to make the break at 5 o'clock. Then the second half of the meeting will be preceded later on after 15 minutes, and some of our guests will go to the other places. Yes, we have to start in 10 minutes, maybe. Uh, yes, okay, to open this. Okay, you can proceed to the meetings which you are engaged to. So it is clearly understood that the uh, schedule is very tough, so please. Now the floor is given to Mr. Yusuf bin Ahmad al Altoman, Secretary General of Organizations of the Islamic Cooperation, please. Mr. Yusuf, you can go. Please. Okay, sorry. Sorry, now the floor is uh, going to Mr. Abdulaziz Otman al Tuvejri, Director General of ISESCO. Thank you very much, Mr. Abul Vaskarayev. It is a great honor for me to be in this auspicious gathering, and I would like to thank Her Excellency Mrs. Mehrban Aliyeva, the Vice President, the first Vice President of Azerbaijan. Uh, President of Haider Ali Foundation and the UNESCO and UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for uh, arranging this beautiful meeting. And also I would like to greet my colleagues from the international organizations who are all present here and commend the work they do and appreciate the cooperation and the partnership that brings us together in this noble mission. Sharing responsibilities for human security building sustainable and inclusive societies is a very, very, very noble mission. And to achieve it, I think we have to work together to disseminate the culture of dialogue and mutual respect in our educational curricula, in the media channels, in the culture forums, and in religious speeches, as well as in the new social media that is uh, now overwhelming all the exchanges and the com communications and contacts between the youth, especially all over the world. It has a great role to play, and, and, I, and if you don't pay attention to it, many dangers and many threats might penetrate through it. Also, we have to work collectively to fight all kinds of phobias, discrimination, hatred, and injustice, as well as, as, well as extremism, terrorism, and all forms of uh, killings, destructions, in, 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 uh, integrate, uh, transgressing over the rights of peoples and nations. The world is facing many challenges and many dangers. 
And uh, I think the wise people, the intellectuals, the dedicated men and women who love to see peace and coexistence uh, prevail in the world and uh, uh, the, all, the, all these forms of, of threats and, and, and challenges disappear are all called to work together in a very unified manner to stop all the destructions, all the wars that are killing people and destroying monuments and destroying relations all over the countries that have been plagued with this and meaningful and needed uh, destruction. The word order, as I can see it, and I have said this many times, uh, is not just. It's based on uh, giving the powerful the right to crush the weak. And I think to develop sustainable development, we need to share. The ethic of sharing, the value of sharing, is found in all the religions, in all the cultures, in all the philosophies. And uh, uh, through sharing, we can uh, be, resort to our humanity, to our an inner goodness that is in uh, everybody's hearts and mind. And I, th I think sharing is, is, is a value that has to be also taught to our children in the schools. And it has to be disseminated through our communities in mosques, churches, and synagogues, and temples all over the world. We shouldn't be shy when we talk about the values of humanity. The world is, is becoming more violent now, and that's because of the, the culture of, of, of strength and uh, overpowering the, 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 the weak to take all whatever available uh, from good, goods and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, attainable uh, rights, but they, they are not rights. They, they, they are usurped and stolen rights of other people. And I think uh, the, the role of education is, 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 is very, very important in this process. We do it with a humanitarian solidarity, with a spirit of togetherness, with the spirit of steadfastness. Yes, there are many challenges. Many of us will be disappointed or, you know, the enthusiasm will disappear or weaken, but this is not needed now. The world needs you all to work together to make our life better, to make our life safer. Now we cannot travel safely. We cannot uh, visit each other safely. Each country is looking to the citizens of other countries with suspicion, especially those who come from the Middle East or Africa or Asia, in the Europeans and the Western countries, airports, you know, the eyes are all on those who come from these parts of the world. They are susceptible terrorists, which is, uh, you know, unfair, because those who travel are not only uh, criminals, the majority are businessmen, intellectuals, uh, tourists who would like to, to enjoy the beauties of those countries. So we have to listen the the, the, the the, the spirit of, of suspicion, of uh, treating people in a very rude way. The criminals have to be brought to justice. They have to be cornered. We have to all, all of us work to get together to, to, to stop their criminalities and their terror that they spread in the world. But there, there should be a differentiation between those criminals and those innocent people. I personally went through very terrible situations in some airports. Although I don't look like a terrorist, do I? Uh, so, uh, th 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 this is not right. This is not right because we are all messengers of love, of respect, of, of being, uh, uh, you know, soldiers in, 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 the, in, the, in the battalion of peace and goodness. Finally, we have to pay attention to our youth. They are the future. We have to make sure that we listen to them. We support them. We encourage them. We give them opportunities to work and to uh, excel in their work, to be uh, brilliant in what they do, to have innovations in their minds and in their work, and also to see what they want, what are, what are their priorities. You know, we cannot always dictate them or tell them that what we did is better and they have to, uh, to, to, to follow us and imitate us. No, they are created for their time, and I think we have to support them to make their future better than our, pre than our present. And this has to be done in all 
the countries of the world. It is not the responsibilities of the Middle East or the Arabs or that or this, but all, all the countries should do this because many youth in the West also are being, you know, fueled with the ideas of racism, of fearing the immigrants, fearing the minorities, and uh, everything in their mind is, 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 is a source of threat to them. This is not right. I think this forum, with this beautiful gathering, the respectable ladies and gentlemen here who represent very important organizations and countries, I think they have a great responsibility to make this dream come true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mr. Kwejri. Now the floor is uh, going to the Assistant Secretary General of North Atlantic Treaty Organization for Public Diplomacy, Mr. Tajan Ilden. Thank you, Mr. Minister, uh, Madam uh, First Vice President, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a particular privilege and pleasure for me to be part of this discussion today. It is a very important initiative and uh, our uh, gratitude and congratulations go to the host country, Azerbaijan. Uh, NATO, the organization that I represent, is an alliance of 28 members and uh, soon it will be 29, uh, but also of 41 partners. And partners are not just a cosmetic element for NATO, they are an essential part of our policy making and daily work. For more than 25 years, partnership has been our tool to build sustainable and inclusive societies. As NATO has expanded and evolved over the past two decades, we have learned an important lesson. Security is not only about what happens at home, it's also about what happens in our neighborhood, beyond our borders. So we are working with our network of partners to step up our efforts to project stability to the south and the east. The way we see it, if our neighbors are more stable, we are more secure. Since its inception in 1994, NATO's partnership for peace has deliver delivered tangible benefits to NATO allies and partners alike. When it comes to human security, allies and partners have used Partnership for Peace to develop policies together. NATO has been an established track record on human security issues, where these relate to defense and military cooperation, and this track record has helped to build up NATO's profile under its core task of collective security. Human security has relevance for NATO in at least three dimensions. Uh, in developing responses to challenges faced in operations, in building capacity in partner states, and in the development of security norms and principles at the global level. In all this endeavor, we cooperate and coordinate with uh, other regional and international organizations, many of uh, which are represented here today. Uh, we require, as I emphasized this morning in our panel discussion, a comprehensive approach <coughs> to do things uh, relevant for our individual organization, but complement each other. <coughs> Partners have often been at the forefront of driving NATO's human security work, including by leading and shaping policy debates, developing and implementing policies, and supporting these by financial or in-kind contributions. And I must say that uh, the host country, Azerbaijan, has been, has been contributing immensely to our efforts at NATO, be it uh, taking part in resolute uh, support mission uh, in Afghanistan uh, or in other areas. Now, I will give a few examples. Uh, the NATO Euro-Atlantic uh, Partnership Cooperation Policy on the Implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security and Related Resolutions. The NATO Policy on Trafficking Human Beings, Joint Work to Develop Policy and Regulatory Responses to Private Military Companies. 
joint work to capture and disseminate standards and best practices for protecting civilians in armed conflict, fighting corruption in the security sector through the Building Integrity Program, education, training, and exercising on human security issues, including through relevant course offerings in the Partnership Cooperation Menu, as well as those offered by the Partnership Training and Education Centers. The safe destruction of stockpiles of surplus and obsolete landmines, weapons and munitions through trust funds. Collaboration on human security related science for peace and security projects. Joint work on civil emergency planning and disaster response, including through the Euro-Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center. What I have to highlight is that usually NATO is seen to be a military organization with uh, a considerable military might, uh, whereas its soft power uh, is not that much uh, visible. And all these examples uh, clearly indicate that first, we want to reach out to uh, our neighborhood. We want to have cooperative uh, engagement with our partners in uh, strengthening their resilience to cope with the threats of our time, be it uh, terrorism uh, or uh, migration. Partners are a key contributor to the core task cooperative security and improved governance, including the defense and security sector, is linked to long-term and lasting stability. Investing in developing viable, effective and resilient defense institutions is essential to this challenge and to securing the long-term success and sustainability of NATO efforts to support partners. Uh, with these words, I would like to express uh, uh, our thanks and appreciation once again for being included in this very important discussion. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And now uh, I would like to pro propose to give the last four before announcing the uh, coffee break at five o'clock. And the floor, the floor is going to Mr. Mario Lubetkin, Chief of Cabinet of Secretary General of FAO. Please. Thank you. Excellency Mirivan Alieva, First Vice President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Mr. Abulfas Garayev, Minister of Culture and Tourism of Azerbaijan, distinguished heads and representatives of internal, international organization, Excellencies, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I would like to thank our generous host, the government of, and the people of the Republic of Azerbaijan for their warm welcome and hospitality and to organize this high-level meeting of international organization that can contribute to all of us to try to work better together. It's a great honor for FIO to be an active partner of the Baku process and we are very excited to be organized the second plenary session of this fourth World Forum and Interactive Dialogue focusing food security and community resilience, essential elements in achieving, sustain, in achieving sustainable development and peace in the framework of the 2030 Agenda. This is a true testimony to the urgent need to work together toward reducing cross-cultural tension and building bridge between communities in light of the commitment made in this very challenge issue that is the 2030 Development Agenda. Allow me to take a moment and present FIO perspective on the event we are today, namely food security, peace, and the importance of the intercultural dialogue. Food is a central component in the daily life of the people across the globe. Food is an integral part of our cultural identity and our local roots. Food security is a condition for long-term stability and peace. Food security is also a powerful instrument in establishing cross-cultural understanding and tolerance. Food security is a widely recognized and a catalyst for bridging cultural difference and fighting poverty. Effort to revive 
the agricultural sector and trade and improved food security have had positive effect on the sustainability of peace. The creation of rural jobs, particularly for youth, and the enhancement of livelihoods in the agricultural sector help reduce the risk of and replace into violence. Violent, violent conflict affect the ability to produce, trade, and access food, including by inhibiting farming, damaging infrastructure, and destroying markets. A conversation on food can help spur a dialogue that allows us to understand what makes the other unique, to see what we have in common and to realize how we can use diversity to strengthen our ties. It's therefore evident that there cannot be true food security without peace, and not least in peace without food security. And for this, we need to support continuously and strengthen the dialogue, dialogue among cultures and creeds. The Baku process plays an important role within the framework of these novel goals. In that respect, like uh, we announced this morning, it's a pleasure to inform that the high-level event under the title of Interfaith and Intercultural Dialogue on Food Security and Peace that FIO and the United Nations Alliance of Civilization are co-organizing uh, this year with the support of the government of Azerbaijan within the logic and the framework of the Baku process. The event will be organized in the FIO headquarters in Rome and uh, we will invite different partners to be in this initiative. This idea of this meeting is to bring together religious leaders, distinguished personalities and experts to discuss interfaith and intercultural aspects of the joint world towards sustainable development, especially food security, and ultimately eradication of poverty and hunger. That is our proposal. FAO is working hand in hand with member nation, organization and entities of the UN family, civil society, and the private sector through many activities to address the immense challenge our planet is facing. We are convinced that it's only together that we can find adequate solution for the global problem of today. In this respect, I would like to reconfirm that FIO is ready to continue to play an active role in the future endeavors in this important process that we are discussing today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mario Lubetkin. Uh, now, before uh, announcing the break, I would like, first of all, on behalf of all the participants, to thank the first Vice President of Azerbaijan, Mrs. Meribana Aliyeva, for her contribution to our conference and for the support given in all the preparation of the forum, and especially this first high-level meeting of the leaders of international organizations. We hope that the decisions which will be taken here will influence the cooperation and understanding throughout the world and our joint activity in favor of peace and sustainable development. Thank you very much. And now we announce the 15 minutes break. And after that, please proceed. We will start in 15 after 17:15. Uh, uh, and note that in the evening we have a special program uh, with the cultural uh, presentation in the old city of Baku and then the special reception at the uh, passage restaurant you have it in the program. Once more, thank you, and we have 15 minutes break. Thank you, Mrs. Mary Banaliva, for being with us.